can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Alano Vasquez of CyberWise. And Alano, before I introduce you formally, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out. If you're watching this right now, I'm not in my normal setting because there's a snowstorm in Chicago. So maybe you're watching this in the summer and you're like, how's there a snowstorm? But that's what's going on right now in this time. So other episodes you should check out. Um, include i did an episode two episodes with jason swank and that's actually how alana and i met um you can check out digital agency elite if you are an agency owner and you want a a group of amazing people to get to the next level with um check that out he had uh, one episode alana was how he built his agency to eight figures and sold it the other one was what his other company looks at when they're acquiring agencies. Uh, so that was interesting. Um, Audra Brem, I had on tips for keeping your brand relevant using social media. I had Duncan Alney on uh, expanding your brand impact through social. Uh, and then I had, you know, we're going to talk about niching, right? Because mm-hmm. when people think of cybersecurity, they think of Alano and CyberWise. But um, Pete Cunningham, uh, he, he, you know, has an engine behind growing. He helped... Uh, healthcare clinics grow from nine clinics to 60 clinics. And so his niche is really healthcare. So if you come to Pete and you're like, hey, I have this cybersecurity company, he's like, I only deal with healthcare, right? And so we're going to talk about niching and how important that is and what impact that's had on Alano and his company. And, you know, I want to say this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a business to launch and run a podcast. And we do strategy, accountability, and execution. So Alano knows me a little bit by now. You know, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that over the past decade than to profile the people and companies I most admire on this planet and profile them. And shout from the rooftops what they're working on. So other people know. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. Uh, I'm excited to introduce my friend and colleague, Alano Vasquez. And he is the CEO and founder of CyberWise. And they help cybersecurity companies grow their brand awareness and pipeline with value-driven content um, and you know, created just for cybersecurity experts by cybersecurity experts. So Alano, thanks for joining me. Of course. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Like Jeremy said, my name is Alano, CEO and founder, also head of growth here at CyberWise. Um, That was a great introduction. We are focused on helping them grow their brands, grow their pipeline through content marketing. Um, And like you said, we're all about specializing, niching down. And even though cybersecurity is kind of like a world of its own, there's niches even within that. You have the educators, the SaaS companies, the service providers, it has still helped us tremendously and tremendously in providing value to these companies by just honing in and going a mile deep and not just a mile wide in that case. So talk a little bit more, Alano, about what you do and what mm-hmm. CyberWise does. Yeah, for sure. So we typically are helping companies that are trying to become market leaders in their respect to space in the security, security area. Like I said, whether they're a service provider, an educator, a SaaS platform, a distributor, but today they're either struggling to develop, you know, more brand awareness, brand authority. Uh, They don't have the leads that they need to kind of support their aggressive revenue goals, or they don't have the sales enablement content in place to actually close those leads or speed up time to close. And even though you could address it with a lot of different treatments, whether it's saying, hey, branding is going to fix that, website is going to fix that, the end of the day, we believe the content marketing, which is like the fuel for the marketing vehicle, is what does that because that is what provides value and educates. And today, as many people know, security is growing at a rapidly alarming rate. It's not a matter of if you're going to get hacked. It's a matter of when you're going to get hacked and then how you respond to that. We were just discussing some of the trends, right? It's about a $200 billion marketplace today. And McKinsey is forecasting it to be close to $2 trillion in the next decade which is amazing to see that growth rate. 
But what's happening is there's a lot of people that are just unaware, um, overly cavalier about their own security or a lack of, you know, thereof or not the need of even having it. And so they become victims to bad actors in the space. So really our job is to come out and help educate on behalf of these security companies by creating really valuable content for them to share. Well, how do um, do security companies do marketing right? I mean, I think it applies to all all companies, but we'll speak specifically to security companies. What I've found really interesting is some of the best security companies are bred from a background of an engineering first background, right? So they're not marketing first, they're not sales first. They're there just trying to build really good products, really good services. And so they have this amazing product which at times never gets to see the light of day because there isn't the sales or the marketing engine behind it. But we see the companies that have really grown and scaled, raised capital, hit that, you know, billion dollar mark plus having a strong product offering, and then eventually kind of growing into the marketing and sales component, right? But quite often companies do hit a ceiling and we've seen it at the $10 million mark, the $25 million mark, where they just stay engineering focused and they never really are able to build a brand um, and generate, you know, the pipeline and awareness that they know to, need to scale to be the nine-figure or billion-dollar company. What are common questions you get in that regards? Are they asking you when do we start this? At what point, or what are, what are they asking you when they come to you? It's such a mix. It's such a mixed bag, and I think it kind of goes back to our own branding and positioning today. As we have niched for cybersecurity, I mean, we've offered everything from branding, web development, web design, and content. So we see a a wide array of leads. Um, We've seen people come in that have needed the ground up build from brand, web, and content, but they're coming in just asking for something like SEO or ad spend or like ad management. And then we just have to keep peeling back the layers of the onion to reveal like, well, actually our CEO just increased our year over year growth by 20%. And we don't have the leads to satisfy that. Our sales team isn't set up to satisfy that. So beyond just better SEO and ad management, we need a good strategy, a marketing campaign that's going to actually help hit these greater business goals. What do you see uh, as the biggest problems in the space? I would say, kind of going back to like what I mentioned is these engineering first approaches are good at a product level. They're really proud of their retention and building better products than others, but getting out of the engineering first mindset and then talking to your your audience, talking to the prospects that you want to work with um, and really getting to know those personas to see what it is that they want and need and not imposing on them what it is you think that they want to need and talking to them in a language that they don't understand. Even a CISO who is very technical prefers a level of communication that is more like business to human and not just business to business, all the way down to like SOC analysts, you know, security architects. They have so many needs beyond what these engineering first companies think that they have. Um, so build, really being able to understand the personas better is, is huge in being able to take these engineering first companies and building them into market leaders. I've heard you talk about Olano, you know, speaking to the buyer in different aspects of the journey, right? And I'd love for you to talk about how you see content marketing for these companies and how it affects the buyer journey. Yeah, I mean, content should help serve the entire brand or you know, buyer journey. Um, if you keep it in the simple buckets of threes of someone is either problem aware, solution aware, or vendor aware, You can say they're in the awareness phase, consideration phase, decision phase. There's really like five to seven phases all the way past, you know, uh, purchase. There's retention, right? There's loyalty. So you should be creating content that delivers value along each phase of the buyer journey. A blog, a podcast could be good for awareness. An infographic, a case study could be good for consideration. A battle card, a comparison guide could be good for decision. And then for retention and loyalty, there's a bunch of other things that you can do, like um, inviting them to exclusive events, content, spiff programs, rewards, and content you can create to, to retain these customers. So content is the is the fuel for the vehicle. And if you run out of that fuel, 
you're either going to miss out on certain areas of um, building out that buyer journey of content. And then what happens is it becomes a very heroic effort for the sales team to try to bridge that gap. And I did talk to a security company earlier this week that has no content and they have turned over salesperson after salesperson um, because a cold call to a chief information security officer who's very busy at a Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 company is not going to is not going to work, right? Especially if you need to have ten to fifteen touch points, and if they have five other decision makers who have to come in, you're not going to win that opportunity. And you find the you know the asynchronous content is it is something one it builds trust without somebody having to be there. By the time they get someone on the phone, they have satisfied some of their questions and and um, learned a little bit more. Exactly. Yeah, I was I was speaking with the uh, CEO and founder of a um, of a content uh, software platform called Hushly. His name was Geoff, and their tool allows you to kind of curate content like on demand. So imagine we had created twelve pieces of content that serve all the way from awareness, consideration, and decision. Typically, people are used to getting dripped content. There's lead scoring and it takes weeks or months to get all of the content that's there at your fingertips. So if we know that the security space just has long buyer journeys and a lot of decision makers involved, what if you could almost serve up content like Netflix and Amazon Prime does? You get done watching one cooking show and it recommends six other cooking shows. So if you consume one piece of content like a blog or a podcast with Ashley or a video piece of content, it's going to summon up a bunch of other relevant content. And so by leveraging technology like Hushly in particular, we're able to then speed up the entire buyer journey um, and get, you know, the, the, the sales process moving a lot quicker. Yeah, I love that. I'm bringing up, if you're watching, if you're listening to the audio, you'll see, uh, you can watch the video as well. And you can see I'm bringing up uh, cyberwiseherecom because uh, I want to show this for a second, Alano, because you, um, you eat your own dog food in that respect. And so when I was poking around your website, um, we're on the page where it says create cybersecurity marketing campaigns that attract ideal customers. And you have this cheat sheet. So I'd love yeah. for you to talk about that. Yeah, definitely. So we're big fans of not just building pipeline with leads that don't matter. We want to be able to attract ideal customers. Like we all have that one or two customer where if like we could just scale, copy and paste them we would be happy. These are customers that pay on time, that um, pay what you expect to be paid, and that are just awesome to work with. So that's what we try to model our customers' potential pipeline after. And so with this marketing campaign cheat sheet, it helps connect the dots of those more lofty business objectives. Like, hey, we really want to focus on working with this particular type of customer, whether it's a persona type or whether it's a company type, a company size or revenue. And this marketing campaign cheat sheet does a very high level, uh, you know, provides a high level way of doing that. So it ties in business objectives, assigns key results, and that points to several marketing um, tactics that you could use to implement to help get those results and get those ideal customers in your pipeline. What we're looking at too is the cyberwise.com slash cybersecurity dash marketing dash campaign dash cheat dash sheet is there a specific uh icon people can go to uh i guess it's under the resources people can check yeah. out marketing campaign cheat sheet the other yeah. thing i want to ask about is you know when someone you know learns about this like what else what's the next step right and you have a brand scale 360 consultation yeah uh, how does that work so here's what's cool. After you download the um, marketing uh, cheat sheet here, you're actually provided with a webinar afterwards that shows you how to use it. Um, so you could begin to start to implement your own marketing campaigns if you have the team and the resources to do it. If not, we can help you. But usually a marketing campaign is a bigger endeavor, right? So before a security company just says, hey, let's get into, um, you know, into bed with this marketing agency, sign a big six-figure contract, and then hope they could hit our ambitious pipeline goal of 10 to $20 million, there's a crawl walk one approach, right? And instead of having an agency just prescribe some canned solution, we like to kind of build the proposal with the client. So we do a form of discovery, which is very common in the security space doing assessments, much many security service providers do it. And so they're pretty comfortable doing it. So we have the brand scale 360 opportunity assessment that we do that helps us to better understand their business goals, their marketing goals, 
We audit their current brand, website, and content. So we could provide a marketing roadmap that ultimately lends itself to a successful marketing campaign. And in the process, it allows them to get to understand you know, our process, how we operate, get to know us as people. They get time with our subject matter experts who are also cybersecurity um, specialists as well. And that gets them a much better understanding and a taste for what they can expect on the other side of a March, you know, larger marketing initiative. Alana, people who go through this, what do they say is the most valuable piece? I know there's probably a lot of valuable pieces, but what sticks out to some of the companies you work with that go through the brand scale 360? I would say once they finally see the dots connected between what it is that they're actually asking for, if a client is saying, hey, I want to improve SEO, but after we talk to their CEO, their CTO, their CRO, we start to uncover that there are several other other things driving that ask that are even well beyond SEO. And by the time we end up autopsying everything from their marketing spend, we start to reveal things that were causing their problems before that they didn't quite understand. So while they thought that maybe they just needed more air in their tires for their marketing vehicle, they needed a new engine. So we'll go and we'll look at their spend and say, hey, why are you only investing 10% of your marketing budget um, in content marketing? And you're also complaining that you're having poor SEO performance. Let's get that up to 30, 40% of your total marketing budget. So there's a lot of aha moments in just looking at the data and then connecting the dots and saying like, well, how many MQLs and SQLs do we need to actually hit our pipeline goals? And we bring all of that together. Um, and it's things that they don't always do, you know, soup to nuts, but they have disparate data points and we bring it together in a comprehensive way. And it really offers that aha moment. Yeah, I see as I'm scrolling through here, I see uh, Cisco on here. I see Webroot on here, FireEye, Westcon. Um, Webroot sticks out to me. Talk about Webroot for a second. Yeah, we worked with Web, Webroot from the beginning back at you know, the beginning of the pandemic. They were doing tons of events every year um, at Black Hat, you know, and they were showing up with their physical booth presence, as you can imagine. And that was a big channel for them for, for sales opportunities and leads. And they sell largely through um, a, a channel, right? So they have a lot of service providers, value added resellers that resell their security software solutions. And so once the pandemic hit, they had to get creative and figure out a way that they could continue to exhibit. And much of us, as we know, during the pandemic, these quote unquote virtual trade shows were just snooze fests. People would just have their avatar pop up and actually act attending. They were just going because they were forced to, and it was not engaging. So we actually ended up developing a virtual booth that was completely interactive. So you get to go through this web portal, there's a booth attendant, and then there's this very conditional path you can go down. If you're a MSP, you could go this way. If you're a value-added reseller, you could go down this path all the way to the point of being able to figure out how do I better sell Webroot? Um, how am I supported? And it was very um, tailored to their specific buyer journey. Um, and that virtual booth experience was really cool. And I know they're still promoting it today. And um, yeah, that was just something so outside of the box of what we had seen in the past. And it was fun to collaborate on that project, Webroot. So I want to why cybersecurity? I want to talk about niching for a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. It was kind of just, I mean, we we knew the market was growing quick. Um, like I said, it's a $200 billion market today and it's expected to grow 10 times. So there's a lot of good economics behind it, which an agency should typically look for when they're niching down. Um, but there was also us just autopsying our current revenue. And as you can see here, Westcon, Cisco, um, FireEye, Security Scorecard, there was a point when we finally were like, we need to look at the current revenue of customers we have, because years ago, we were just focused on B2B tech, and it was kind of all over the place. And we realized we had about a 60% concentration just in working with cybersecurity companies. And so we decided to niche down. Um, and then within a year, we ranged like, you know, number one ranking on Google for cybersecurity marketing agency, cybersecurity content so on and so forth. And then that really just brought an influx of demand for us. And it, it's worked out really well so far, not even just for the prospects, Jeremy, but also for the talent. So we recently had brought on um, a gal named Danielle Duclos, who is former SVP of marketing over at Bluefin, um, a security payment um, company. 
And she found us just on Google um, after she had left her company, like literally the next day, she said, and she was so inspired by what it is that we're building here and what it is we're trying to do to kind of help this space at a larger scale. Um, she asked if she could come and work for us. And now we have her plugged into really cool projects um, like web overhauls and brand overhauls we're doing with companies like Sands Institute, um, Security Scorecard, and so forth. So it's it's helped us to niche down and specialize both in terms of growing brand awareness pipeline, but also just in attracting like world-class talent. Love it. This is something actually you instruct the companies you work with to do. You have a niche funnels product. Yep. Yep. Niche funnels is the product that we've built for companies that have not currently or have not done a great job of trying to target specific audiences. Um, I'm saying like all the way to the point of on your website saying, here's the industries that we serve. You could be a service provider. You could be a SaaS company. And if you were to autopsy any service provider or to autopsy their kind, their current client mix, they're typically going to see that they're working from anywhere from healthcare companies, FinServe, government, uh, manufacturing, agriculture, and then kind of reflecting internally and saying, are we built a little better to specialize and work with a particular vertical? Not saying you have to say no to any particular prospects that come through, but saying we're willing to take that leap of faith and launch a marketing campaign targeting a specific vertical, like let's say financial services. So you go down this path of creating let's say 10 to 15 pieces of content from blogs, case studies, comparison guides, use cases, um, threat reports that are completely focused on financial service. Then you forklift that into um, a very targeted ad campaign somewhere like on LinkedIn, where you can target groups that have you know chief information security officers or SOC analysts in groups specifically for financial services. And then you just see such a greater conversion rate and level of engagement with the content because it's so tailored to them. So that's what that niche funnels, you know, product or program is all about today. You know, I see a lot of advantages and benefits to niching. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you come across people who have a hesitation, right? Mm -hmm. They feel like they're going to alienate. Well, we still have another, like in your case, you 60%, yeah. you still have another 40% of other customers and you're almost not speaking to them anymore. The messaging isn't. What do you say to people who have that hesitation, who may say, you know, Lana, we have all these other clients, we don't want to alienate them? Yeah, I would say that, you know, that's what a majority of people do say. Um, I, I almost think it, it's it's a biological thing, right? We're, we're not built, I feel like, as humans to, to um, laser focus in on any one thing because we typically operate from a place of scarcity at times. Um, and we want to be able to say we can serve anybody. And so it's kind of putting aside that, you know, pre-wired mindset and saying, you know what, maybe there are riches and niches, as that saying goes, and then being able to do it um, in a way where you're not taking your entire marketing budget and sinking it into one vertical, but being very strategic about kind of piecing, a, you know, enough of a chunk out of your marketing budget so you can test out verticals. And there's a way to do it at an MVP level. You don't have to rework your entire brand to make it seem like you're only serving one customer type, but you do need to create content that allows them to, to believe that that is a focus of yours. So it doesn't have to be on the homepage, but it could have a landing page and it should have relevant content linking to that page. Um, and the other thing I see typically is people that are unwilling to niche down. It may just be because they're too new of a business. And they haven't had that experience serving enough different customers. And at that point, it's totally fine. And I probably wouldn't recommend niche funnels. And I would prefer for them to kind of, you know, continue to live out the business and see, you know, which industries they like working with. So there is enough data that is required, I feel like, to take that, to kind of take that vertical mm -hmm. leap with niche funnels. Yeah. yeah and one of your points is you don't necessarily have to go all in. You could have different landing pages that mm -hmm. serve the niches, um, in which case, Great. So you have one for manufacturers, you have one for healthcare. And so when someone of that, you know, particular niche, you go, hey, check out this information and that does speak to them. So you don't have to, you're saying you don't have to revamp the whole website, but you could have a specific page tailored to them. Exactly. Yep. A funnel as we could call it. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, you have a company, uh, a service provider in the security space, and I'd love to learn more from that standpoint, just getting into the weeds a little bit more about kind of how you serve companies. Yeah, like I said earlier, I mean, we thought once we niched down in cybersecurity that, you know, it was going to be very linear. But after jumping into it, we're like, hey, we're working with brands like Sand Institute on the education side to distributors like Cynics or Comstore at the time, to software manufacturers like Security Scorecard, and then several other service providers who usually are you know, uh, called managed service providers or managed security service providers, MSSPs. But as the market evolves, they're starting to focus more on managed detection and response. So we have a service provider we're working with that was focused originally on um, the service um, MSP side of the business. And now they're focused on managed detection and response. And within that, they had not really tried to claim their space, their vertical or their niche at that point. Um, and they did come to us with a very tactical marketing request that we then discovered that they actually need to roll out a larger marketing campaign. So after going through the whole brand scale 360 and the opportunity assessment, we developed a few marketing campaigns that would help them identify a few key verticals that they could go after. And that's helped them tremendously, like I said, in just engagement with their content, conversion rates, recognition as being the thought leader. Because at the end of the day, it really is about those people willing and bold enough to choose a focus and then to articulate a consistent claim of expertise. And then finally, kind of add the missing skills. Whereas most people believe and they become complacent saying, you know, once we become you know, uh, experts at this particular vertical, then we'll go and we'll market it. And we say, hey, maybe there's a way to kind of go to market it while still also learning and adding those missing skills as you can go. And that's what they've done. And then there's been such a great feedback loop and how it's helped evolve their product because now they're building it around a very specific type of customer. Love it. You know, your background starts off uh, in in sales and selling. Yeah. So... Um, I'm sure this comes up when you're doing the um, your brand scale 360 and when you're talking to companies, what are some of the advice you've given um, on, on selling? Always be closing. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn Gary, Glenn Ross. Yeah, I think, I think a big thing for me, and it's funny because I use um, the Otter app on my Zoom calls to see how much or to see what we're saying, you know, afterwards I get that transcript. And I'm always looking at how much am I talking versus letting the prospect talk, right? I think if we can be more of elephants and less of hippos, meaning big ears and not big mouths, then we can get so much more value out of the conversation, just letting them talk. Prospects will try to get you on the call and say, hey, tell me about your business. But that's not what they really want. They want to tell you about their problems, their pain. And I would recommend, you know, talk to them about your business towards the very end once you've understood all of their problems and pain points. And that will help you better position your offering. So that's been a really big one for us since we take a very consultative approach. And I think a lot of security companies in the service space should focus on that as well too. And it just builds a ton of rapport. So to talk about that, right? Someone comes on with you, Alana, and they go, the first thing is, hey, Alana, how are you doing? Can you tell me more about your business? How do you flip that? Yeah. Well, I, I usually try to lead the call, pre-indoctrinate the call a little bit. I send a video over prior to hopping on the first meeting, telling them like, hey, before you know we get on this call, I'm just going to prep you. I'm going to ask you um, a few questions about your business before I jump into us so I could have kind of enough context to make sure that I'm recommending the right services or solutions for you so that by the time they get on the call, they're kind of expecting that. But in the event that I don't, you know, I'm not able to communicate that to them. And right out of the gates, like, so tell us about your business. I, I typically flip it by just asking them, and you know, well, first, before I get into us, how did you find us? And they usually tell me that, well, I was looking on Google. What were you searching for on Google? What else were you searching for on Google? Why were you searching that? And then all of a sudden, the conversation's now flipped on them telling me about how they're going to lose their job if they don't, you know, double the pipeline in the next six months. And then, of course, we're here to help save them, right? Yeah, no, I love that uh, you said that because, <clears throat> you know, that is really understanding what their major issues and pain points are 
and you can't really speak to them without understanding them first. Right. So, um, you know, I would love to hear more about, um, you know, as far as when you're talking to the client, um, what are some of the things you want to understand first before you kind of go into making recommendations or telling them more? So I usually try to hit all four points of, of band, budget, authority, need, and timeline. It's so easy. If you don't have that like post-it noted on your monitor, you know, when sales conversations get going, we as salespeople um, can get happier. And then the conversation just is over before we know it. And we're like, oh man, we didn't even schedule a follow-up call. We didn't ask if they're the only decision maker. We didn't even ask the budget. So I typically try to hit on all of those. Um, and we've done it either through the form of phone calls or even like an intake. So we'll send over like a 10 question intake, just a Google sheet that they could fill out. And we have dozens or hundreds of leads that have populated this before even talking to us, where they're willing to kind of tell us their revenue goals, what hasn't worked um, with their marketing, their current marketing budget, what they're willing to invest, how soon they want to get started. So in some cases, before we even hop on the call, we've kind of knocked the whole band part out of the park. But hitting on those budget, authority, need, and timelines are crucial, especially in the security space when you're providing a service that costs six figures and there's four to six decision makers. You really can't go past go and you know until you hit on those. I'm curious, Alano. Um, you know, we take you back to Alano in high school in college okay most people are like i want to be an agency owner when i grow up what what did you want to do when you were younger so in college i i majored in econ i think i was just kind of following the herd of a few other friends who were in finance um at that point but once i got there there was a program over at uc santa barbara where i went for econ um, that was called the technology management program And it was taught at the Bryn School of Engineering, which is a really beautiful part of campus. And the professors weren't just professors. They're actually like venture capitalists, like from Santa Barbara, Montecito, um, like some really big time people. I think we had um, a few special guests, like the founder of DoubleClick.com, Kevin, I can't remember his last name, but like a multi-billion dollar company come in and we were just spending all of our classwork time putting together business plans, concepts, and then really just going down the path of operating like small business owners and having these really talented professors and uh, mentors pour into us. And then it was between the summer of junior and um, senior year, I actually took an internship for a marketing company called Octagon Sports Marketing. And that was all the way out in South Africa. So I went to Cape Town Um, And I was there for almost three months. I went all by myself. So that was quite the adventure. And I worked with this firm and we were focused on, you know, launching um, several activations around the World Cup at that time. That was back in 2010. And so it was just so surreal being in, you know, such a different place in the world, going from Santa Barbara to South Africa and just getting thrown into this mega agency and huge responsibilities put on me, even as an intern, like I was cold calling people trying to set up pretty big meetings. And I even had just maybe one or two wins amongst that and got positive feedback from some of the leadership team where it must have implanted something in my brain. And then fast forward a decade later, I'm running a marketing agency. So that's how I've kind of tried to, you know, connect the dots of the past. And how did I arrive here? I think it was building blocks along the way for sure. So did you know you want, it sounded like you knew you want to do something in business at that point in general. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur of my own at some point. I just didn't know what that launching off point mm. would look like. Um, and I was actually laid off after my first job. And I was like, really kind of down and out. And I was like, man, maybe I shouldn't be going down this path of working for startups and trying to do sales. But I got picked up by um, another friend of mine at the time. His name's Paul Hashemi over at Spin Touch. He put me in charge of sales. But when I started the company, I'm like, there's no marketing here. So I had to put on my marketing hat, learn everything about brand, web, lead gen, building websites on WordPress, getting in what I used was Photoshop at the time and running Google ads. And that gave me a lot of those kind of notches on my belt that make me felt like I could eventually run my own agency. And after a few years of doing that, I I, I branched out 
um, to launch our own agency. What I find fascinating about you uh, from my research, um, mm-hmm. so we'll see if this is accurate because everything on yeah. Google is true. Um, yeah. You put yourself through college. Yep. And um, how did you balance putting yourself through college, paying for college, you know, actually, you know, it's a lot of work in the education part. Yeah. Well, I mean, my parents took care of me as best as they could all the way through high school. So I was pretty blessed. I got to go to private elementary school, um, Catholic high school. But as you can imagine, that's so darn expensive that it almost zaps the entire education budget just in the first, you know, 18 years of life. So I enjoyed a, a glorious three to four years at a junior college here in Sacramento. I remember just taking art classes, playing guitar, and doing other hippie things in between the breaks. And then I was like, all right, I need to get the show on the road. And I was like, I'm just going to apply for some good schools. So I tried UCLA, um, Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara, UC Davis. And I landed that, you know, I got accepted at Santa Barbara. And I was like, I better take this. This is a really good school. Um, But I was like, I don't have any money saved for college. So I had to go through that exhaustive effort of applying for grants, which I unfortunately didn't get any at the time. Um, And then just applying for private and federal loans. And so I racked up a pretty big uh, college college debt bill um, over just two years. But I was like, hey, this is expensive. I better get in and out of this, you know, higher ed stuff pretty quick. And along the way, you know, I had friends that were working at Starbucks, pizza shops, minimum wage. I was like, I didn't think I was the quickest at learning some of these complex econ, you know, courses like game theory. So an accounting. So I was like, I need as much hours to study as I can. So I ended up getting into uh, personal training while I was there. And I would go over to different fraternities and sororities and just try to meet people and put on these boot camps. And I found a, a gym owner in Santa Barbara who gave me some space at his MMA gym, uh, Valhalla gym in Santa Barbara on State Street. And I remember I was just doing like two training sessions a week with like 10 to 15 people in a boot camp and making like a week's wages so that I could get back to focusing on studying and a little surfing in between. So you really did have your own business. You started your own business in college. In yep. health space. Yep, exactly. And I thought, you know, I'm surprised you didn't go on to like own a chain of gyms or something like that after that. Yeah. You know, I've, I've mentored um, my brother-in-law in starting his gym. I helped him build his brand and website. We talked about going in and ownership with it. Um, but it's been fun just kind of helping some of the people in the fitness space, um, like my brother-in-law. Um, he has a, a fitness company called Advanced Basics. And just seeing like, if we applied the branding that I know um, and the content marketing, it's really helped blow up his business. So I think that would be if I ever did sell the agency that would be something I might look back at at doing. Even if I was just a personal trainer working for someone else, I love the fitness space so much as you and I talk about quite a bit. It really is where my heart is at. Well, first of all, I want to thank you. I have one last question. And okay. I, I know you read a lot. So I'd love to know resources or books that have helped you. Um, before you answer that, uh, I want to point people to Cyberwise dot com to check out and learn more at cyber and then w h y z e dot com uh and so i want to talk about uh some of the the books or resources that you've learned from throughout the years that other people should check out well i'll give you the spectrum i'll give you the first book i read in business ever all the way back to when i was in junior college um to the more recent book that i have read that i think is really valuable too So, I mean, everyone's heard of it, how to win friends and influence people, right? You can cover a lot more territory in just five minutes showing genuine interest in somebody else than you could in five years trying to get them interested in you. And that's why it's always so flattering when people just keep asking us about ourselves, even if we're a little more introverted, which I can be at time, people are really trying to get to know you and you you get to open up. And that book taught me a lot. So I always highly recommend that book, even if it's the first business book you pick up. to more recently, I, I've read this on a couple occasions now, but uh, Blair Inns, The Win Without Pitching Manifesto. Blair Inns also has a really good podcast called The Two Bobs Podcast, where they really talk about value-based pricing and helping out agencies not just give away their services as a time and material billable, but trying to develop something unique enough to, for a unique audience 
where you can remove yourself from time and materials and sell based off of outcome. With the furthest extent of that being, can you get a percentage of success for what your client is going to ultimately achieve um, and be on the upside on the profit side and maybe even reduce some of your initial costs? And so that book has taught me a ton when without pitching manifesto, that is just, you know, I feel like I'm still trying to absorb a lot of it and apply it, but that's a really good one I'd recommend too. Alano, I wanted the first one to thank you. Check out cyberwise.com. More episodes of inspiredinsider.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Alana. All right. Take care. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 